The impact of the achievement system can't be overstated. Giving players a virtual trophy to show off and reminisce about their accomplishments provides unique challenges in all forms of content from PvP to PvE, solo to group, and gives that extra little reason to do all the interesting tidbits that come up during, say, world events. Top that off with unique rewards and titles unlockable by doing some of the hardest tasks that WoW has to offer, you have an excellent system to motivate players to do the things they otherwise wouldn't. Because let's be real, if you didn't get that pop-up saying, yay, you did it, you wouldn't get exalted with the Timbermore Hold, for instance. Originally brought back in patch 3.0.2 in Wrath of the Lich King, the past decade the amount of achievements has almost quadrupled. But with the clever use of old footage, we can see what the original set of just over a thousand were. As ultimately, when people logged in back then, they didn't just start with zero achievements. No, Blizzard had gone through and done what they could to award each character with the accomplishments that they could prove. This was done through either obvious stuff, like if you were, say, level 70, you'd get all the 10 level increment achievements, because, well, obviously you hit 70. The less obvious stuff was like quest tracking. Say you did your civic duty in Classic and dropped Anixia. Blizz would then see that you'd completed that quest and logically say, yeah, you killed Anixia. Then where quests failed, loot prevailed. And with people saving items and banking from some of their most heroic kills, also providing the proof that you killed the big bad men. So why do I bring this all up? Well, I'm sure you could guess based on the title of this video what the plan is. To go through all the achievements that you can get right now in TBC Classic and how to do it with a proof required, so in Wrath, inevitably drops in roughly two years from when this video is released, you'll have a substantially bigger number than everyone else. And really, that's kind of part of the reason we play WoW. Today, with the introduction to this series out of the way, we'll start with a general tab, which by far has the least amount of stuff on it that you can really achieve. First off, nice and easy, the leveling achievement. You get one for every 10 levels, starting at 10. So just by hitting max in TBC, you've already snagged yourself seven achievements, each worth 10 points apiece. So well done, off to a flying start. The second achievement we'll look at is even easier. Whereas leveling takes tons of time, getting all seven bank slots is a lot easier. Now the price is capped at 25 per slot, you'll be able to bank this achievement for a little over 110 gold. Now moving on to the slightly more expensive side of things, there's the writing skill achievements. There's one for each level of writing, from journeyman to expert, and this is going to cost a total of about 6,500 gold total, and that's not including the mounts themselves. So really, for these four achievements, you just have to have either gotten the GDKP train back in Classic, you'll have to do a lot of dailies, because admittedly, you can get cash pretty easy in Outland, or look up one of the many guides on how to make gold in TBC. Well, so far so good. Pretty self-explanatory achievements, just cost a bit of time, bit of gold. So let's move on to something a little more involved. As with the achievement system, Blizzard also added in collections in Wrath. So the next two we're going to look at is about collecting. First, pets. This series of achievements starts with just requiring one pet, then goes to 15, 25, and then in 25 increments after that. If you're ready to fill up your bank with all of the companion pets that you possibly can find, I'm about to go through all the ones you can find in Classic and TBC. And to start this round up, we're going to go with the ones that you can just buy from a vendor. I should also point out that you're going to need a friend on the other faction, or kind of have to camp the neutral auction houses. Specifically, I'd recommend Booty Bay, because that seems like the more popular one, at least in Classic. And so, we'll start with the Mighty Horde, where you have three snakes you can get in Orgrimmar, one cockroach in Undercity, a prairie dog from Thunderbluff, and then three dragon hawks in Fairbreeze Village, giving us a starting total of eight easy ones that you can get for the Horde. Then on to the Alliance, and because Blizzard has a huge amount of favoritism for them, they have 11 pets that they can pretty easily get. You have the Snowshoe Rabbit from Dunmorrow, you have the two owls you can buy in Darnassus, four cats you can buy just outside of Stormwind in Elwyn Forest, and they also have the White Kitten, which you can buy off Little Tippy, who spawns roughly every two hours in Stormwind. Walks around for about 15 minutes and then despawns. Should also note that Little Timmy only has one of these cats per trip, so I'd probably try and grab him before Wrath comes out, because then he's going to become a lot more camped. Lastly, of course, not to forget the new Draenei, there are also three moths that you can get in the Exodar. Beyond these faction-specific pets that you can buy at vendors, there's a few neutral ones. You have the Ancona Chicken from Magnus Turth in the Shimmering Flats in the Thousand Needles. Should be noted that 
if he's not already selling them, you actually have to emote slash chicken and then slash beckon to him. Which makes this a little more interesting to actually get. Next you have two different parrots you can get from Nark in Booty Bay. Which doesn't require anything fancy, you just buy them. And then finally in Outland there's Dealer Richard in the Netherstorm. Who as an exotic pet vendor provides a red moth, a blue dragonhawk, a brown rabbit and a mana wormling. After you've purchased these from vendors or other people on the auction house, there are three that you can obtain by quest. If you're an alliance, and only one you can get if you hoard. The first for the alliance is the Spirit Data Hatchling, which you get at the end of a quest chain, starting with Freedom for All Creatures in Feralus. The next is the Prairie Chicken, which is the infamous Clack quest from Westfall, which requires you to slash chicken a chicken, and then eventually feed it a special chicken feed. Now, in theory, a horde can do this quest if they can get the special chicken feed, except it's only sold from Farmer Saladin. So they'd have to specifically hunt this out on the auction house to get it to go and do it. Then thirdly is the mechanical chicken. What you have to do is do all of those distress beacon quests. One in Tenaris, another in Feralus, and the last in the Hinterlands. Do all three, you go down to Booty Bay and talk to the gnome who owns all of these mechanical chickens, and he gives you one. And next, on to professions, where there's ten total pets to get here. Interestingly enough, the five you can get in Classic are all from Engineering, and the five you can get in TBC are all from Fishing. In Classic, we have the Tranquil Mechanical Yeti, which you learn after completing the quest Are We There Yeti from the Goblins in the Everlook in Winterspring. You have the lifelike mechanical toad, which just has a schematic that's a random drop. You have the mechanical squirrel, which is another random drop schematic. And then the last two are a little more frustrating to get. You have a tiny walking bomb, which you get by completing the member card renewal for goblin engineers. And little smoky, which you get by doing the same quest, but for gnome engineers. So if you want to get both of these pets, you do have to switch different types of engineering because they are bind on pickup. For TBC, it's a little more straightforward. First is the Magical Crawdad, or Mr. Pinchy, which does, spoiler alert, have its own quest associated with him. To get this guy, you have to go and fish up Highland Mixed Schools in Terraka Forests, and this requires a max fishing of 470, so you have to use lures to get it. And you also have to have a flying mount to go up and find these pools, which you'll sort of see, especially in the areas filled with Arakawa. Just have to keep fishing these until you get a Mr. Pinchy, and then click on him three times and you have about a 10% chance to get the magical crawdad box. The next four are pretty self-explanatory. All you need to do is the Crocolisks in the City daily quest by Old Man Barlow, and we do have it confirmed that fishing dailies are in from the very start of Classic TBC. It'll have the bag of fishing treasures, which has the chance to have in it Snarly, Chucks, Muck Breaths, or Toothy's Bucket. So if you just keep up with the dailies by the end of TBC, you'll have all four of these guys. The next way to get some pets is through the reputation system specifically in TBC, where you have the tiny Sporbat from getting exalted with Sporgar, and then you have the Nether Ray Fry, which you get by getting exalted with the Shatari Skyguard. And I'll go through the best way to get exalted with both of these factions during the Reputation Achievement Guide. The last type of pet you can get outside of specific world events are your world drops and your dungeon raid drops. Most of these are found in Classic, and most have a very low drop chance. The highest of the rare ones is about 1.5% for the Disgusting Oozling, and can get as high as 15%, but that's only for one of these. You've got the Crimson Whelpling from the Whelps in Wetlands, the Dark Whelpling from those in the Badlands if you go to the far right of the map, the Emerald Whelpling from the Swamp of Sorrows, the Disgusting Oozling that you get from the Ooze Bags that you find from, well, oozes throughout Azeroth. You have the Hyacinth Macaw, which has a 0.0 to 0.02% drop rate off every blood sale enemy throughout Stranglethorn Vale. Then lastly, you actually have a more Horde-specific one, the Black Tabby Cat, which you can get off the Dalaran Spell Scribes, which are in the Amber Mill in Silver Pine Forest. For TBC, the only world drop is the Firefly, which you can get off the Bog Flare Needlers in Zangamarsh. Then for your dungeons, you've got two that you can find in the dead mines, and that's the Siamese Cat off Cookie, and the Green Wing Macaw, which is just a random drop. And then the next two are both in the Lower Blackrock Spider. The Smolderweb Hatchling from the NASTY quest, 
And then you also have the Warg Pup from the Kibler's Exotic Pet quest. Both quests neutral and started in the Burning Steps. And not to miss out, TPC has two which are far later on in the piece. You've got Mojo, which requires you to use an Armani Hex Stick in one of the frogs in Zulaman, and the Phoenix Hatchling, which drops off Kael'thas Sunstrider in Magister's Terrace, not the Eye, which comes out alongside the Sunwell and the Isle of Queldenas in Phase 6 of TPC. So everything we've just covered, you can pretty much get any time. And so, the last type of pets you can get are from world events. There is a bit of a revamp during TBC for your things like your Midsummer's Fires Festival, Hallow's End and Brewfest, which all come with an assortment of companions for you to obtain. And if you're serious about getting as much of this achievement as possibly done in, you'll have to keep an ear out. For the Dark Moon Fair, you have a Wood Frog, a Tree Frog and a Jubbling. The Jubbling is a bit more unique because it requires you to go and get two Dark Iron Ale mugs from the Grim Guzzler in the Black Rock Depths. Talk to Morja, an orc female near some wagons, get a quest off her, and then lead a jubbling with those dark iron ale mugs to her. She'll then give you an egg, which will hatch in seven days, which is the only timed release item until Wrath of the Lich King, with the chance of getting the green proto drake from Solazar Basin. Love is in the Air, which is around Valentine's Day, has the petal feet. Children's Week for the last two years has had the pig, rat, and turtle rewards for taking children throughout the world. And these do change in TBC because you now have a, a mini elk beholder and little bird thing still half in his egg. It's kind of hard to explain. So unfortunately, if you didn't get the, the two of the three classic pets, you've already, already missed out. And I feel like a lot of people have because they don't really advertise that Children's Week is on. For a classic Christmas, you've got both your red and green helper boxes and the winter's reindeer. And then not to ruin Christmas this year, but what you'll probably find is a clockwork rocket bot, which do fight each other. And now as a quickfire round, just to get through the pet section of this video, we have the sinister squashling from Hallow's End, which drops off the headless horseman, the pint-sized pink pachyderm, which you get from Brewfest for 100 tokens, the Wolpertinger from Brewfest, which you get by doing the quest capture that vault for Tinger. And lastly, the Scorchling from the Midsummer Fire Festival, which drops off Lord Ahoon's ice chest. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all of the pets that you can obtain in Classic and TBC. And if you thought that was a comprehensive list, next we're going to be talking about mounts. And my god, there's a lot of them, and if you really want to fill out your mount collection tab, you're going to have to put in some serious bloody work. And the first bit of work is that not all classes are born equal. Paladins and Warlocks with their unique 60% and 100% ground mounts do actually count towards this quest. So if you're 100% min-maxing this achievement, those are the two BIS classes. But, like the pets, we'll start off with the factions and just the ones that you couldn't, in theory, buy. The interesting thing is, you kind of need Exalted, and that's where the biggest pain in the ass for these actually come in. For my own mad quest to do this, I went from friendly to exalted with Silvermoon first day of the pre-patch, and that took 508 stacks of rune cloth, and at two gold a piece, that was about a thousand gold just to get exalted with one of the other four factions to get a hold of these mounts, which are thankfully a lot cheaper now in TBC. So the first piece of advice I can give you is look out for cheap stacks of rune cloth and just chip away at those exalted reputations. Because basically every single last faction will give you five to seven mounts each. With the Alliance actually having two more factional mounts than the Horde do, with the Horde, the Tauren and Undead only have five mounts apiece, with the Orcs and Trolls having six, and the new Blood Elves seven. But for the Alliance, everyone has six except for the Gnomes who have seven. This is kind of made up for with the PvP mounts, where the Alliance have four, Horde five, that still means that the Alliance is one off better than the Horde are. And before we continue, although I'll go into it in a lot more depth in the reputation guide to follow, if you're not a fan of just handing in a bunch of rune cloth, keep an eye out for special world events, like taking your kid out f during Children's Week or doing anything in Midsummer's Fire Festival will typically give you reputation with all of your faction, which can be an excellent way to keep up with it and push for Exalted for those extra special mounts for your collection. 
Although not requiring nearly as much reputation, the last of the faction mounts are the flying ones that you can get in Shadow Moon Valley. There are three for your 60% flying and then four for your epic flying. So seven more for each faction there. Outside of these racial mounts, next you have the PvP ones, which don't actually have a rep requirement, only taking 30 Altric Valley, 30 Warsong Gulch, and 30 Arathi Basin Marks each. So you have to farm 150 of each of these for all five of the mounts, which are the black versions, which all do look pretty damn cool. These aren't the only PvP mounts. The next we'll look at is the Talbucks in Hala in that Grand where both of the Talbucks will cost you 170 battle tokens, where you get one per honorable kill in Hala, and 35 research tokens, which are a repeatable quest you get from handing in Oshugan Crystal Powder, which you naturally get from the mobs around Oshugan in Southern De Grand. And on top of these PvP mounts, there's also likely going to be a mount for a very high arena rating, like the infamous Armored Nether Drake from some of the first seasons. But this is harder to quantify because Blizzard might change up how they give out loot. So if you're planning on getting as many mounts as you can, this is a bit harder of a source to rely on. Next, we'll look at a few more mounts behind a rep barrier. Although these are all the ones in TBC and they're a lot easier to get than the factions ones. First, the Scenarian Circle has the War Hippogriff for a princely sum of 1.6k at Exalted. The Shatari Skyguard sell the Nether Rays. The Maghar Orcs for the Horde and the Kurunai for the Alliance sell Talbucks at Exalted. And later in the expansion we'll get the Netherwing Drakes which take around a month of dailies to hit Exalted with. Once again these will all be detailed further in the Reputation Guide. But now, we'll go through the rare mounts. The prestige ones, the ones that people look at and go my god how many runs did it take. The ones that people still, more than a decade later, still farm out because they are so rare and so excellent. And first, we start with the Rivendare's Steed from the Baron and Stratholm, the only undead horse the Alliance ever get access to. There's the Tiger and the Raptor from Zul'Gurub, the Ashes of Alar from Kael'thas in the Eye, the Reigns of Midnight from Ataman in Karazhan, and the Reigns of the Raven Lord, which drop off Anzu, a boss only summonable by druids who have gone through the epic flying quest in the heroic version of the Sethic Halls. And if you are a druid in TBC, you could actually be selling these Anzu boss runs. All of these mounts are incredibly hard and rare to get. I wouldn't be 100% banking on them if you're going to be making your mount achievement collection tally, but it's definitely worth mentioning. And the last set of mounts are all special mentions. The first is the Amani Warbear, which is obtained by speedrunning Zulaman which, if you are killing the bosses regularly enough, you have to complete in under 45 minutes. And you have to do this in TBC, because once Wrath drops, the Abani Warbear disappears. Outside of this, a lesser known set of mounts, the Karaji Resonating Crystals, are actually added to your collection and count as mounts. Although, even then, you're still not able to use them outside of AQ40, except for the black version, but that's kind of a you have it or you don't at this point which was obviously obtained by getting Scarab Lord in Classic TBC during the AQ40 event. Then last but not least in the special mention section is the Winter Spring Saber, which is only available to the Alliance and requires a hell of a rep grind to get. Whereas the Horde equivalent of the Venom Hide Ravisaur doesn't actually come out until Wrath, so, so look forward to grinding that one out when we're all level 80 and have nothing better to do. And now we can take a breather, so at this stage I'm sure you're starting to understand that some of these are going to be drastically easier than others to do. You'll be able to do some in various degrees, and although they're challenging, these are what achievements are meant to do. They're giving you a pretty nice guideline for going out and doing unique things. And with that said, I'm going to end with two far more relaxed, chill achievements in the general tab. The first, equip a tablet. The easiest one is you can get a guild tabard from any capital city, but especially in TBC, every faction has one, so it's a piece of piss to do. And the last one is equip the gigantic bag from Harris Pilton in World's Edge Tavern in Shatrath. This costs 1.2k, which is a 22 slot bag, which is amazing value, quite frankly, because it's one of the largest bags that you can get even throughout Wrath of the Lich King, so it's kind of worth it if you've got the spare cash. 
For now though, thank you all for joining me on this self-made quest for getting all the achievement points possible between now and the Drop of Wrath. If you like this idea or want to keep track of it, please subscribe below and if you want others to see it, give it a like as well. Thank you very much for your time and I'll see you later.